and thank you for listening to the history of World War II podcast, episode 376, The Falcon of Malta. The bombings continued. Nothing was spared, not even the areas or buildings designated as hospitals. If anything, the large Red Cross made them easier to spot, which meant hospital staff started becoming patients of their own workplace, which meant fewer qualified people to care for the wounded, and that number continued to grow. To be sure, the pilots were still going up, but it remained a numbers game, and that rarely benefited the defenders. And the stress on them was telling. Back in January, it was determined that a pilot should be rotated out every six months. Now, here in June, Hugh Pugh Lloyd cut that back to three, which did nothing to help the Army personnel, or more importantly to the pilots, their ground crews. Yet, this was good news for Peter Rothwell, a Wellington pilot. Hugh Pugh called him in and said, right, your six months is up, we have a Wellington that needs serious attention, so why don't you fly that plane, yourself, and a small group of pilots who have also reached six months, to Cairo, tidy and efficient. This was on June 21st. Rothwell was only too happy to be his own driver in getting out of this hell, so he loaded up his stuff, took on some fighter pilots and others, and lifted off. About an hour and a half into the flight, one of his two engines started to flame. Geez, this bird really did need an overhaul. Rothwell got the fire out, but it came back, so he had to shut down the engine. With now only one engine, Rothwell had everyone on board throw out all of their belongings, and even then, they might not make it back to Luca Airfield. There was certainly no way they were reaching Egypt. So the plane was emptied and struggled mightily. Rothwell did get them back safely, but no one had any possessions left. They tried again a few days later, but by then Rothwell had come down with something. So his trip to Egypt was done while lying on back of a stretcher. But at least he was out of there. Another thing happened on June 21st, which would send panic throughout the island. On June 21st, 1942, that was the day Rommel finally took Tobruk. Now Axis planes based in North Africa could threaten the area even further to the east, like Egypt, or north, like Malta. It was finally all coming together for the Germans. In reaction to this expected event, 601 Squadron was told they were heading to Egypt to help stem the Rommel tide but would it be enough? For many were predicting that Egypt would go the way of Tobruk. Dennis Barnum of 601 Squadron was told to supervise the adding of long-range fuel tanks to the squadron Spitfires, and he did his level best, though he was suffering from Malta dog dysentery, and he doubted whether he and his would make that much of a difference against the Desert Fox and his air arm. But then in stepped Dennis's personal savior, that being Group Captain Woodhall. Woodhall had learned long ago, take care of the men, and they'll take care of everything else. Clearly, Dennis was barely on his feet. So when the squadron took off the next day, Woodhall called Dennis into his office and said, No, not you. You've got 200 operational hours under your belt. No, you're going home. Dennis would miss his mates, but he missed his wife, properly working bowels, and peace even more. And now for something completely different. Picture Pappy Boynton and Adrian Warby Warburton having a baby. It would be an ace pilot, to be sure, but one much less excited about following orders or doing things the way that everyone else did them which perfectly describes George Buzz Burling of Quebec, Canada. Born in 1921, George was a bona fide loner from the start. Rules did not interest him, nor did whatever the prevailing trend was at the time, like listening to authority figures. No, his brain would come up with an idea, and George would pursue that idea to the exclusion of all else. Believe it or not, this did not make him the ideal student in school 
as school was not his thing. He would be fussed at and punished, but nothing could break him from pursuing only things that he was interested in. As is common among so many flyers, the day that George saw an airplane at age 14, practically everything else fell into insignificance, if they weren't there already. George Burling arrived on Malta on June 9th, having lifted off from the HMS Eagle, but there's a very good chance some squadron commander out there was trying to get rid of George, as he refused to be a team player. During the Battle of France, the British pilots were given their instructions, and George would nod in all the right places. Then he took off. Once he was in the air, George simply went off on his own to shoot down Germans. Nothing else mattered to him, even when an officer got in his face. The problem for the brass was, George was a natural flyer and fighter. He was also scoring an impressive number of kills, though that did not change the wider war in France. A coin toss decided that George would go with 249 Squadron, and his immediate supervisor would be Raoul Dado Longley, the new leader of a flight of 249 Squadron. It didn't take long for Longley to see that George was a great flyer and aggressive as hell. On his first morning out, George and three other pilots intercepted eight 109s. This was normal odds for the Spitfires. But George was certainly the wild card that day. Breaking away from his group, George harassed a 109, ignoring another 109 shooting him up the back until the target 109 lost its tail. None of the other Spitfires saw this, so George was credited with damaging an enemy plane. Perhaps he was telling the truth. He was an odd one, always alone, but in the coming days, George, or Screwball, as he would be dubbed, would show them that that day of June 12th had not been a fluke, whether anyone saw it or not. Before going on with Screwball's exploits, it's important to set up the rest of his story. Longley saw the talent, but was incensed when George broke away from the unit. To wit, Longley said something to the effect of, if you don't tow the 249 line, then let's be quite clear about this, you'll be on the next airplane into the Middle East. But Screwball was unfazed. He simply replied, Boss, that's okay by me. I'll play it your way. Which is not exactly a resounding, Sir, yes, sir. But Screwball flew within the lines, mostly. For George, all that mattered was flying to shoot down other planes, to test himself. He had no qualms about killing. He probably did not spend too much time thinking about the other pilot. He simply wanted to pit himself against the best. And being on Malta, he would get to test himself and his theories. Yes, Screwball was a thinker, not just a fighter. As for the name Screwball, George liked to complain about everything, and indeed, it must have been hard for him to go from the home island to Malta. But each frustrating item was labeled by George, a goddamn Screwball. The word left his lips so often, it was easy for his mates to give him that designation, and really, Screwball did not care. People were only worth listening to, per George, if they could do anything to help him spend more time in the air, and if they had something smart to say about flying. That was it. The rest were tolerated. Barely. And like Warby, Screwball dressed like he was auditioning for Monty Python instead of a combat flyer. His shorts were always too big, always threatening to fall down if it wasn't for the belt. His hair was a bit too long and just as untamed as his flying, his socks were always rolled down. Basically, George was a poster boy for being out of uniform. But this was Malta. As long as someone could fly and fight effectively, almost everything else was tolerated. Further, Screwball, like Pappy Boyington, hated the idea of only flying to protect bombers or staying in fighter sweeps. No, he wanted to rush at the nearest enemy plane, shoot it down, and then move on to the next. Everything else was a waste of time and fuel 
and Screwball was about to get his chance at implementing his ideas. For in early July, Flieger Corps II, based on Sicily, was reinforced. The air attacks on Malta were about to be ramped up again. It was 8 a.m. on July 6th. Screwball and seven other pilots were scrambled and struggling to get to a decent height. Their targets that day were three Italian bombers and 30 fighters, all heading for the Luca airfield. It was risky, it always was, but the Spitfires were told to go after the bombers first. They were the real threat to the airfield and its facilities. Screwball zeroed in on a bomber, ignoring the other bullets flying past him, and when he was close enough, he let out with a burst. The pilot was killed instantly, and George could see that the observer, also in the cockpit next to the pilot, tried to rush for the controls. Screwball guessed he was hoping he could fly the bomber back home. Scratch one bomber. As Screwball had lost some altitude at this attack, he was rising once again, but this happened to put his sights near a Maquis 202 fighter. Another short burst, with George's bullets going into the enemy's fuel tank, and seconds later, the Italian fighter was heading for the sea. From here, Screwball saw another 202 fighter on a mate's tail, so he completed a climbing turn, which put the fighter in his sights. Another burst, another enemy plane, downed. Screwball went up two more times that day, but saw nothing. Yet, in that same evening, seven Junker 88 and fighter escorts were spotted. To meet this challenge, Screwball two other pilots, and Dando Longley, as George called him, Daddy Longlegs, rose up in their Spitfires. Daddy Longlegs went after the bombers, with the help of the others, so this left Screwball to distract the 109s. And what better way to get their attention than by putting bullets in their planes? Sure enough, Screwball's antics got him lined up with one of the 109s. Problem was he was still 800 yards away. Still, the 109 was posing a problem for another Spitfire. So, with nothing to lose, Screwball picked a spot above and in front of the target 109 and squeezed off a few rounds. Amazingly, the 109 started to smoke and descend. Turns out that Screwball hit the pilot's glycol or antifreeze tank. The rest was left up to physics. Now, to be sure, this was an amazing shot. Like an NFL quarterback throwing a ball on a long route, you estimate the target speed and direction, and then you let fly. Or a submariner taking a long shot with his limited number of torpedoes. It's usually not worth the risk, but on this day, it paid off for Screwball and the pilot he saved. And having trouble believing his success... George himself followed the 109 down until it exploded and fell into the sea. Four days later, July 10th, Screwball was up and at it again, taking out another Maquis 202 fighter. And with that kill, in just four days, Screwball became an ace with five kills. But he was just getting started. As the compliments he received could not compete with the thrill of the hunt, and the kill. Two days after that, July 12th, George was out again, this time looking for pilot officer Berkeley Hill, who had splashed down. But during his search, Screwball came upon two Italian pilots looking for their own downed men. With George was another pilot, flying officer Eric Heatherton, and together they dove down to get behind the second of the two Italian planes. Screwball let off a burst, and the second plane started to smoke, catch fire, and finally descended. Next, the two Spitfires closed in on Lieutenant Colonel Aldo Quarantotti. The Italian spotted Screwball, but by then, it was too late. Closing within 100 feet, George let loose, and his bullets decapitated the Italian pilot. Literally. His plane, too, was soon heading for the waters below. Two days after that, now July 14th, it was Screwball who was jumped and barely survived. 
When he landed, the ground crew saw that his plane was riddled by better than 20 bullets through the fuselage and wing. George added on that an explosive bullet nicked his right heel. Though Screwball was a loner, it was probably his successes as a fighter pilot that loosened his hold on himself, so soon he was best friends with French-Canadian pilot Jean Paradis. But on July 22nd, Paradis was lost. Yes, Spitfires were still being shot down, just at a much slower rate than the Axis planes. Still, each loss was keenly felt. The next day, July 23rd, Screwball went up, but was in no mood to play. First, he chased an enemy bomber around, who gave up the mission and just focused on surviving. In the end, the bomber was heavily damaged, but managed to flee the area. Next, George mixed it up with a competent Italian pilot and a Maquis 202. Each plane had only so many bullets and shells, thus there was much maneuvering, all to set up a quick fleeting shot. Yet in the end, Screwball took off the other guy's left wing. And the Italian records support this by saying that Sergeant Bruno Di Pauli was lost as his left wing disintegrated by Screwball's bullets. But it would be July 27th that turned out to be Screwball's greatest day. But before we continue, Screwball in opposition to his name, treated dogfights like the science they were. There were two planes with various capabilities, just like the pilots. But Screwball kept a little notebook with him at all times, not unlike Leonardo da Vinci, but in George's book, he was always writing down ideas about attack angles, various speeds, and shots that worked and those that did not. Then he would go back to the drawing board. The result would be a new theory every few days, and Screwball was anxious to try them out. To the detriment of the Axis planes, his ideas worked more than they did not, especially when you add in his innate ability to judge distance, time, and speed, something that fewer than 1% of the RAF pilots could do as well as him. Back to July 27th. Screwball came up against the Italian pilot Ferrero Gelli and took him out rather quickly. However, as Captain Furio Niclot Doglio was nearby, George then went after him. But what should have been a clash of masters was not. Doglio had been a test pilot, he had set numerous records in the 1930s, and currently was an ace in his own right with seven kills. But no, instead of a master class in air duels, Screwball went from Gelly to Doglio in less than 10 seconds. All that evaluating in between battles was starting to pay off. After that, because they had been relatively easy kills, Screwball still had enough ammo to justify sticking around. Much to the sadness of two other 109 pilots, as George took them out as well before returning to home. So it will come as no surprise that Screwball, on July 24th, was awarded the Distinguished Flying Medal. His citation read, Sergeant Burling has displayed great skill and courage in the face of the enemy. One day in July 1942, he engaged a number of enemy fighters which were escorting a formation of Junkers 88s and destroyed one fighter. Later during that same day, he engaged 10 enemy fighters and shot two of them down into the sea, bringing his total victories to eight. But Screwball was not done. On September 4th, he won a bar to his Distinguished Flying Medal. The citation read, Since being awarded the Distinguished Flying Medal in July 1942, Sergeant Burling has destroyed a further nine enemy aircraft, bringing his victories to 17. One of his exploits was the destruction of four enemy fighters in one day. During these brief combats, he also damaged a further two hostile aircraft. His courage and determination are a source of inspiration to all. It must be said that Screwball's immediate supervisor, Raoul Dado Longlay, or Daddy Longlegs, 
was having his own successes in June and July. Yet he did not have George's ability to send a bullet accurately hundreds of yards ahead of a 109. Still, he knew his way around the cockpit, and his strength was his courage and ability to get in close. Back on July 2nd, Longley damaged and then chased a Junkers 88 40 miles out to sea. There was a decent chance it would make it back to Sicily, mostly intact, but Raoul stayed on his tail, shooting when the chance came. At 40 miles from Malta, the bomber went down for the last time. Doggedness is another way to success. This represented the 100th enemy plane shot down by the squadron since the Spitfires started arriving in March. Two days later, July 4th, Raoul's squadron went on in full force and took out three enemy planes, with Raoul sharing one kill. As two of the Italian pilots had survived and were captured, the RAF pilots went to visit them at the hospital in Intarfa. As the men from 249 Squadron entered the room for a bit of no hard feelings, just doing my job, hope all goes well for you after this, instead, one of the Italians looked shattered at the sight of the British flyboys, and he slowly raised his arm. He did not raise his hand, as there was not a hand at the end of his arm. Someone's cannon shell had taken it clean off. For Longley, Buck McNair, and Laddie Lucas, this was too much. They smiled, wished the men the best, and agreed never to visit an enemy pilot again. It was best not to know the outcome of each of those dogfights. On July 11th, Raoul got another 109, this time all on his own, and it would be his last hurrah, as Hugh Pugh figured out that Raoul, Buck, and Laddie had done more than their fair share. After all, during the first two weeks of July, 100 enemy bombers had been destroyed. This was not the way Kesselring wanted things to go, which is probably why he asked for reinforcements and were given them around this time. Another man to leave was Hugh Pugh Lloyd himself. As there were now more Spitfires on Malta and more coming, This had helped, in part, to turn the story of Malta into a mini version of the Battle of Britain, with all due respect, and it was felt that a man who intimately knew fighters would serve the island better. And the man replacing Hugh Pugh was none other than Air Vice Marshal Keith Park, who arrived on July 14th. And even his first day showed the difference between himself and Hugh Pugh. As Park was about to land, another air raid came along. Thus, Park was told to circle around for a while. He did this, but later became frustrated and landed anyways. Hugh Pugh wasted no time in telling Park what he thought of him. But it's doubtful the New Zealander, a hero of the Great War, and more importantly, in charge of 11 Group of Fighter Command during the Battle of Britain, the area the Germans focused on, was overly concerned. Besides, everything his eyes took in was now his. Besides, the pilots loved him for his time protecting Southern Britain and appreciated having him in charge almost as much as they loved the arrival of the Spitfires. Park and Spitfires, a winning combination. Ironically, during the Battle of France, he, Park, had gone up against Kesselring, who had been his equal on the other side of the channel. So this would be a rematch, and for the defender, it was the same as last time. As long as he still held the island when all this was over, no matter how devastated it was, it would be counted as a victory. Another thing to be repeated was that two years ago, Kesselring was hampered by his superior, Gehring, and it would be repeated here. Kesselring could already see that Malta had been conquered, just not occupied, like the skies over southern Britain. Was that destined to happen again? Kesselring would do all he could to thwart this, but then he was given a body blow. 
Previously, Hitler told Kesselring that he was just waiting for Tobruk to fall, to move forward on Malta. Now, Hitler used that same event, the capture of Tobruk, as a reason not to invade the island. And Goring backed up the Supreme Leader. Both were thinking of the losses on Crete and did not want a repeat. To which, if allowed, Kesselring would have said, yes, there will be losses, but in exchange we get Malta and Egypt and probably the whole of the Middle East in time. But the man in Berlin could not see past the German dead of Crete. No, Malta would not be invaded, at least not right now, but Kesselring could still make it bleed, make it suffer, and he would, for there was the wider war. Though Axis boots may not land on the island, there was still Egypt, the Suez Canal, and the oil from the Middle East up for grabs, and this time Kesselring would pull out all the stops to make the Mediterranean the territory of this new Roman Empire and the Third Reich. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. So, as you can tell, I'm almost over the little COVID phase of my life. Almost there. Drinking lots of water, but uh, we made it through. So, I just want to say hi to some new members and thank those who have donated. As far as my latest members, Julie Davin from Selden, New York. Michael Gonzalez from Austin, Texas, and Anna Elliott from Lawrenceville, Georgia. They're the latest members. Thank you very much. Uh, They get two extra episodes a month of behind the scenes, you know, kind of the smaller stories of World War II. Anyways, I would like to thank Charles Miller from Asheville, North Carolina for buying uh, a Churchill mug. Thank you very much. And as far as donations, I would like to thank Richard Troy, Axel Prophet, David Lapping, Matt Raffner, and Keenan Donahue, and Peter Tremont, who just uh, donated this morning. So, everybody, thank you very much. It really helps around here. And finally, I would just like to say good luck to Nathaniel, a future history teacher. Thank you for emailing me, Nathaniel. Good luck with everything. I was a history teacher at one point in the late 90s. Uh, So good luck with that. Anyway, I'll see you as soon as I can with the next episode. Take care, everyone. Hurry and shop the final days of Spring Fest at Lowe's. Ready to get started on your spring planting? Right now, get select Bonnie 19.3-ounce vegetables and herbs, three for $12. Save on indoor updates, too, with up to 40% off select bathroom faucets and vanities. Shop Lowe's today, because Lowe's knows spring. Valid through 426. Bonnie offer available in-store only. Actual plant size varies. Excludes Alaska and Hawaii. Selection varies by location, while supplies last.